loving parent, I pray that you once again bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of our collective hearts as we come together this blessed morning. God, our strength and our redeemer, may they simply be enough in your sight. Amen. So I'm having trouble this summer believing that it's August already. The summer months seem to be just flying by these ordinary or numbered weeks between Christmas tide and Easter tide. Give us some time, be it ever short and fleeting, to do some important work as the church and in our homes. Although my closet hasn't been cleaned out and spring cleaning didn't really happen. But it gives us time to care for one another, dividing scriptures and doing time to study and do things, vacationing and having family reunions. I don't know, you seem to have a lot of family reunions. Four, goodness gracious. I don't know, but for me, ours just seem to dissipate. You know, as folks get older, they just kind of don't happen as often. But this week, I took a break from the gospel of Luke and spent time with the scripture from Hebrews. And it's not really an ordinary scripture, but let's look at it. It's Hebrews 11. And I, of course, am using the message paraphrase. It's a little easier to work with. And for folks that aren't familiar with the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible that we kind of borrow from, from our Jewish siblings, I'm going to read it from, again, the message paraphrase. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. This is an aside from Pastor Monica. Not everyone believes this, as the Hebrew Bible suggests, but this is what the message paraphrase says. It's our handle on what we can't see. This act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors set them above the crowd. By faith, we see the world called into existence by God's world, by God's word. What we see created by what we don't see. By an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place that would become his home. When he left, he had no idea where he was going. By an act of faith, he lived in the country promised to him, lived as a stranger camping in tents. Isaac and Jacob did the same, living under the same promise. Abraham did it by keeping his eye on an unseen city with real eternal foundations, the city designed and built by God. By faith, Baron Sarah was able to become pregnant, an old woman as she was at the time because she believed the one who made a promise would do what he said. That's how it happened that from one man's dead and shriveled loins, there are now people numbering into millions. Each one of these people of faith died not having in hand what was promised, but still believing. How did they do it? They saw it way off in the distance, waved their greeting and accepted the fact that they were transients in this world. People who live this way make it plain that they are looking for their true home. If they were homesick for the old country, they could have gone back anytime they wanted, but they were after a far better country than that, heaven country. You can see why God is so proud of them and has a city waiting for them. This is the word of God. Now friends, I like to start with the scripture, if only just to critique it a bit, because we talked about this text a little bit, this text that Hebrews is talking about from Genesis. We read it a few weeks ago. And we know that Sarah's faith wasn't quite that perfect, right? Because she laughed when the messenger came, right? 
And I don't know that it talked about Abraham's shriveled loins that much, but Hebrews is talking about his shriveled loins a little bit graphically. But we know that Sarah's faith wasn't a perfect one, right? And her hope for a child by the time the angels, the messengers, and the God dined with Abraham wasn't exactly one where she was still planning to have children, right? Her faith in God and these messengers was one where she was a little bit on shaky ground. And yet their story, Abraham's and Sarah's, becomes one of cosmic proportions, echoing through the centuries, right? The Abrahamic traditions of religion, right? It founded not only Christianity, but the Islamic traditions and the Jewish ones, right? So we know that you can have a shaky faith and still be fairly okay, right? So let's talk about faith and hope for a bit. And I'm gonna share a personal one, so this is gonna be on the interwebs. And we know that our YouTube channel doesn't get a ton of views, so I think we're okay. It's out there. For over 40 years, I too have been seeking, yearning for my own origin story. And this past Easter weekend, as we celebrated the risen Christ, I was able to celebrate my own sort of resurrection story as my birth father acknowledged me. As this story comes together, my story with spiritual direction, friendships, managing expectations, phone calls, texting, I too am much like Sarah. Right? I laugh a little bit when people are like, oh, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. You're going to have so much, this wonderful weekend that you go there. It's going to be perfect. I know that I too am in need of grounding in expectations. I am now a 46 year old woman, not a six year old child sitting at a window waiting for a car to pull up. Right? It's not going to be perfect. And yet there is still this possibility of disappointment. And I'm still full of wonder, much more enlightened than I was last summer when I was standing in this pulpit. And I brought out my own concordance to find out how many times the Bible mentions the word hope, right? And I know Miranda would sit up in the front row and say, 3,000 times. <laughs> no. Not 3,000 times, but 167 times. And 15 of those times are in the book of Job, right? And I don't know how many of you remember Job, but Job is not a fun character in the Bible. If we, I'm not gonna linger a whole lot on Job, but if we stop for just a moment there, I have these wonderful friends, and I can tell you a little bit about their story. They, um, you can stop at their blog if you want. It's called The Jew and a Gentile Walk into a Bar Mitzvah because one of them is Jewish, one of them is a Methodist. So a Jew and a Gentile. But they will struggle with mental health issues and they'll share it with you on their blog. So I'm not sharing any of their story, but they don't share. They do a great service to Job and his mental health issues. But Job talks about hope. And there's hope woven into Job's story at least 15 times. So if Job can talk about hope 15 times amidst that awful mess of a story, I think we've got some things that we can do in our own lives. And I can have hope in my own story, right? And I've been watching Tiny House Nation because, you know, I know, don't laugh at me. Because, you know, there's not a lot of hope in the housing market for a pastor that makes, you know, what we make here, right? And there's nothing wrong with my salary. It's wonderful. It's perfect. It's exactly what we can afford. But the housing market in Montgomery County is what it is, right? So I watched Tiny House Nation the other day and a family with a chef for a dad two small children in Nashville were talking about going tiny and they were touring homes. They wanted to pay off their student loans, which were about the same as mine. It was six figures. 
So they were looking at models that had apartment sized refrigerators. And how do you feed a family with an apartment sized refrigerator? But of course, the mom said, we're going to find a tiny house that has a real full size refrigerator in it. She specifically said, we're going to find all that we hope for and the appliances that meets all of our needs. And eventually, of course, because it's TV, they did, right? Again, they found a company that could do a build out finally, fully, a customized model that would allow them to cook and be with their family in a 400 square foot space and pay off their student loans by selling their 2,000 square foot home by the end of the show. So I think there's some God in that, but also the magic of television, right? Wendell Berry offers this, a poem on hope. It's hard to have hope. It's even harder as you grow old. For hope must not depend on feeling good. And there's the dream of loneliness at absolute midnight. You also have withdrawn belief in the present reality of the future, which surely will surprise us. And hope is harder when it cannot come by prediction any more than by wishing. But stop dithering, the young ass, the old to hope. What will you tell them? Tell them at least what you say to yourself. Because we have not made our lives to fit our places. The forests are ruined. The fields eroded. The streams polluted. The mountains overturned. Hope then to belong to your place by your own knowledge of what is that to know other places. And by caring for it as you care for no other place, this knowledge cannot be taken from you by power or by wealth. You will stop your ears to the powerful when they ask for your faith and to the wealthy when they ask for your <coughs> land and your work. Be still and listen to the voices that belong to the stream banks and the trees and the open fields. Find your hope then on the ground under your feet, your hope of heaven. Let it rest on the ground underfoot. The world is no better than its places. Its places at last are no better than their people while their people continue in them. When the people make dark the light within them, the world darkens. Friends, Hebrews offers us hope in what we have yet to see. God offers us assurance that we are never alone. We don't know that we will get to the place that we imagine and we dream of. As a historic congregation, we know that our ancestors dreamt of unimaginable things that they would never realize. We also know that there were limitations to their imaginations. I imagine they didn't imagine an open and affirming congregation that welcomed LGBTQ folks. So imagine that they didn't quite imagine a diverse group of people welcoming black and brown folks. And yet I am so pleased that we do because we have much to learn from them, much more than they have from us. They also would have no idea what the Americans with Disabilities Act and yet, I can't imagine us not knowing what it means. And those two are hopeful acts. There is a beautiful contemporary gospel song by Israel Helton named Moving Forward. The lyrics go like this. 
and I'm imposing Jesus a little bit on the text, which wouldn't be the case, but what a moment you have brought me to such a freedom I found in you. You are the healer who makes all things new. I'm not going back, I'm moving ahead here to declare my past is over in you. All things are made new. Surrendered my life to Christ, I'm moving forward. As we move forward, know that we are both grounded in hope and a movement that allows us to have doubts and questions. That's what being disciples in Christ is. We are questioners, we are doubters. And looking at an Old Testament scripture that is founded also in a doubter. Sarah doubted that she would have a child. That is both biblical and part of our disciples' tradition. We also know that even if we didn't reach the pinnacle of where we are heading, our future disciples will take that baton and just like we did for our ancestors, the race does not end. We get to continue moving forward. Amen.